Finally tonight, this year, Secretary of State John Kerry embarked on the task of trying to settle the unresolved conflict between Israelis and Palestinians. Chief Foreign Affairs Correspondent Margaret Warner talks with Israeli author Ari Shavit about his acclaimed new book, exploring that conflict and the contradictions he sees in his nation's history. Sixty-five years ago, the state of Israel was created from the ashes of the Holocaust. Its birth also uprooted by UN estimates some 750,000 Palestinians who'd inhabited the land. The decades since have brought wars, violent Palestinian uprisings, and Israeli crackdowns, and many attempts to negotiate peace. Yet today, the land remains divided, with the majority of Palestinians living in the occupied West Bank and the unoccupied but hemmed-in Gaza Strip. The family story of writer Ari Shavit spans Israel's founding and history, from the days of his great-grandfather, a British solicitor and ardent Zionist. Shavit, a one-time paratrooper, now a columnist, tackles this complex history in his new book, My Promised Land, The Triumph and Tragedy of Israel. We spoke recently at Washington's historic 6th and I Street Synagogue. Ari Shavit, thank you for joining us. Pleasure to be with you. The subtitle of your book is The Triumph and Tragedy of Israel. You're a fourth generation Israeli. Have you always felt that way, that there was a duality to the whole nature of this country? Absolutely. One of the basic things about that country that I loved so much is that it's so complex and usually the conversation about it is too simplistic, this way or another. And if you don't wrestle with the complexity, you don't get it. You don't get Israel, you don't get the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, you don't get the Middle East. The book is a personal journey of real soul searching. On the one hand, Israel is an amazing triumph because it did build a home for a homeless people. So Israel is a remarkable success of a people that have saved themselves and have chosen life and are celebrating life. The tragedy is the conflict, and what my claim is that the conflict is not only about occupation and settlements. It is a deep conflict that has religious, historical elements. It begins from the very beginning because there was an inherent tragic uh, flaw, if you wish, in this great success story of Zionism, and that created the conflict that created a kind of 100-year war which is still with us. Why do you think the Jews, who have, had been an oppressed people, a persecuted people, could not or did not empathize with the Palestinians that they were un, in turn uprooting, as you so vividly describe in this book? I think that what happened is that the need to have a Jewish national home was so deep, this was such a deep existential need, that the first Jews who went there, the founders of Zionism, were blind to the existence of others. And in a sense, this blindness created this conflict from both sides. We were blind to the fact that there is a Palestinian people. The Palestinians were blind to the fact that we are a Jewish people that has a right in that land. My hope is that we will get over this blindness and that will be the key to a real peace, not just a political peace. Now you tell the story dramatically by focusing in on one village or town of Palestinians called Lida, 50 to 70,000, that really on one or two days in July of 1948, they were evicted, some of them murdered. Are you the first to really peel back the layers of the onion on that story? And, and was it a painful experience for you? Writing the Lida chapter was very painful. I thought it was my duty, and I still think it is my duty as an Israeli, being honest about the history of my nation to acknowledge the darker side of our history. But on the other hand, I think it's very important not to take that out of context. One must remember that the 1940s were not 2013 or 2014. 1940s were brutal throughout Europe, throughout the Middle East. One has to remember that wherever the Arabs, the Palestinians won, not many places, they evicted all the Jews and in many cases there were massacres. In order to be honest with our Palestinian neighbors, what I say to them, I must acknowledge Lida. This is my moral duty, but it's your duty to overcome Lida because one cannot be addicted to the pain of the past. 
how much soul searching is going on in Israel, uh, not just among intellectuals and journalists, but, but in the population at large about this? Look, it, I think it's very difficult for many Israelis to go through deep soul searching because they feel endangered. On the one hand, we are an occupying nation like no other democracy. And we may have to deal with occupation. But on the other hand, we are an intimidated nation like no other nation on the face. Intimidated. Intimidated. So occupation and intimidation are the two pillars of the Israeli condition. And usually people on the left in this country and elsewhere and in Israel focus on occupation and ignore intimidation. People on the right focus on intimidation and ignore occupation. We all must wrestle with both. Do you think, though, that the Israeli political leadership could do more to help solve some of those external conflicts? I think there is a need for all leaders in the area to try to achieve what I call emotional breakthrough. If an Israeli leader will go to Amala and speak directly to the Palestinian people, recognize their tragedy and their pain and offer them a future, I think things might change a bit. It will not solve, but the same applies to the Palestinians. I want to see the Palestinian Mandela. There is no doubt that had the Palestinians had a Nelson Mandela, Israelis would have totally changed. There is deep wish on both sides of people to move on, to really build a life for themselves and try to put a lot of the anger and the old ideas behind. But one, one of the greatest problems of both peoples right now, and I'm not talking about this specific leader or another, generally for a long time we've not seen worthy leadership either in Israel or in Palestine. Can the current state of affairs, 65 years really after the birth of Israel, can it continue indefinitely? Absolutely not. I mean, the, 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 the animality of occupation. I, occupation is unacceptable for moral reasons, for demographic reasons, and for political reasons. We have to try to end occupation with peace, what Secretary Kerry is trying right now. But if that doesn't work, we have to prepare a kind of plan B in which we Israelis launch a nation-saving process of ending occupation gradually, cautiously, with wisdom and creativity, while the Palestinians launch a nation-building process in Palestine, building a constructive, life-loving, and hopefully democratic Palestine. Ari Shavit, thank you.